This is going to be a study on the subject of hyper-dispensationalism. And we're going to look at some of the things that they teach and see if it lines up with the Bible or doesn't line up with the Bible. Number one, hyper-dispensationalists teach, many of them teach, that the body of Christ started with Paul. But the Bible teaches that it did not start with Paul. Romans 16, 7 says, Salute Andronicus and Junia, my kinsmen and my fellow prisoners, who are of note among the apostles, who also were in Christ before me. Okay, so if someone was in the body of Christ before Paul, then it couldn't have started with Paul. Not only this, but Paul says that he persecuted the church before he was saved. In Galatians 1.13 it says, For ye have heard of my conversation in time past in the Jews' religion, how that beyond measure I persecuted the church of God and wasted it. Now, some may say he's referring to a Jewish church, but Paul tells us who the church is in the Pauline epistles. And we know by reading the Pauline epistles who he's referring to when he says the church. Because that verse was in Galatians 1.13. And in Colossians 1.18, it says, And he is the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he might have the preeminence. So he's talking about Jesus Christ as the head of the body, the church, the church being the body of Christ. Colossians 1.24, Who now rejoice in my sufferings for you, and fill up that which is behind of the afflictions of Christ in my flesh for his body's sake, which is the church. Okay, so the body of Christ is the church, according to Colossians 1.24, and then according to Romans 16.7, some people were in the body before Paul, as he admits himself. So he says the church is his body, meaning the Lord's body, and Paul says he has persecuted he persecuted the church of God. So it isn't just some Jewish church before the body, as you can see. And then 1 Corinthians 10.32 says, Give none offense, neither to the Jews, nor to the Gentiles, nor to the church of God. So there you have three separate groups of people in Scripture. The church of God, made up of both Jews and Gentiles, who spiritually become neither Jew nor Gentile once they believe. So when Paul says church of God, he's not referring to, to the Jewish church he persecuted. Next, we see that hyper-dispensationalists, well, many times, most of them teach two separate gospels in the book of Acts. Galatians 2, 7 says, But contrary wise, when they saw that the gospel of the uncircumcision was committed unto me as the gospel of the circumcision, was unto Peter. That's what Paul wrote in Galatians 2 7. He's saying, The gospel of the circum uncircumcision was committed unto me, as the gospel of the circumcision was unto Peter. So the hyper dispensationalists will take this verse and teach that Paul gave a certain gospel to the uncircumcision, which would be the Gentiles, but that Peter had a different gospel that he took to the circumcision, which is the Jews. But this is false. What he's saying is that Paul's primary focus was that he was a apostle to the Gentiles, and Peter's focus was to the Jews, not that they had two different Gospels. And just because Paul's the apostle to the Gentiles, as the Bible plainly says, this doesn't mean he didn't give the Gospel to the Jews. I mean, that was his burden. He said, "How I wish myself a curse for my kinsmen according to the flesh. And this doesn't mean that Peter doesn't witness to Gentiles. It just means that's their primary focus. For example, someone who is a missionary to South Africa isn't just going to witness to those people, even though that's their primary focus. When they come over here, they'll witness to Americans. But if Peter had a different gospel, then he was accursed according to Galatians 1, 8 through 9, 
But you can see in Acts 15, the gospel that Paul preached, or that Peter preached, in Acts 15, 8 through 11, it says, And God, which knoweth the hearts, bear them witness, giving them the Holy Ghost, even as he did unto us, and put no difference between us and them, purifying their hearts by faith. Now therefore, why tempt ye God to put a yoke upon the neck of the disciples, which neither our fathers nor we were able to bear? But we believe that through the grace of, our Lord, of the Lord Jesus Christ, we shall be saved even as they. So Peter said, We shall be saved even as they. So there's no separate gospel for the Jews and for the Gentiles. And then 1 Peter 1, 3 through 5 says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, which according to his abundant mercy hath begotten us again into a lively hope by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead to an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled and that fadeth not away, reserved in heaven for you who are kept by the power of God through faith unto salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time. So as you can see, Peter doesn't have a different gospel. He's preaching the death, burial, and resurrection just like Paul preaches the death, burial, and resurrection as you read about in 1 Corinthians 15, 1-4. But the reason that the hyper-dispensationalists want the body to start with Paul is because they want rid of certain things like water baptism. And if you look at 1 Corinthians 1, 14 through 14 14-17, it says this, I thank God that I baptized none of you but Crispus and Gaius. Now this is Paul talking. He says, I thank God I baptized none of you but Crispus and Gaius, lest any should say that I had baptized in my own name. And I baptized also the household of Stephanus. Besides, I know not whether I baptized any other. For Christ sent me not to baptize, but to preach the gospel, not with wisdom of words, lest the cross of Christ should be made of none effect. So they say since he was sent not to baptize, but to preach the gospel, they say that since he says this, that water baptism doesn't apply for today. But this isn't true. The verse is talking about people arguing over who baptized them. And Paul just says that he's glad that he hadn't baptized any of them. So that he's not even mentioned in the argument. But as you can see, Paul is an, Paul's an evangelist. He's not a pastor. That's not his main thing. His main thing is not to baptize people. And to, to say that he sent, because he sent not to baptize, that that means... We don't water baptize is ignoring a lot of those verses because he did baptize some people. But that's not his main thing, you see. So note that he did baptize some people. He baptized Crispus and Gaius. Acts 18.8 8 says, And Crispus, the chief ruler of the synagogue, believed on the Lord with all his house, and many of the Corinthians, hearing, believed and were baptized. So you have it in that order. People believe the gospel to be saved and then they're water baptized not to get saved or to stay saved but because that's something you do after salvation and then Acts 16 29 through 33 says then he called for a light and sprang in and came trembling and fell down before Paul and Silas and brought them out and said sirs what must I do to be saved and they said, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved in thy house. And they spake unto him the word of the Lord, and to all that were in his house. And he took them the same hour of the night, and washed their stripes, and was baptized, he and all his straightway. So you see there, another occasion of people being baptized by Paul. And you see, water baptism is for today. It's not something that saves the soul, as the Campbellites teach, the Church of Christ. It's something you do after you get saved. So if you require salvation, if you requ require baptisms for salvation, then you're wrong. But if you say water baptism isn't for today at all, then you're wrong. If you say it's wrong to get water baptized, you're unbalanced. If you say it's required for salvation, you're unbalanced. Hyper-dispensationalists will fall on the opposite extreme of the Church of Christ. The biblical view is in the middle. You, you get water baptized, but it doesn't save you. 
Not only do the hyper-dispensationalists believe that the body started with Paul and that water baptism isn't for today, they also believe that the Pauline epistles are the only books of the Bible for us today. And some even narrow it down a little bit more than that and make some of the Pauline epistles not apply today. Maybe they, some of them just say the prison epistles. And while it is true that the Pauline epistles are primarily the doctrine for the church today, and we should view the Bible through the lens of those epistles, this doesn't mean that there isn't doctrine for us in every single book of the Bible. But many uh, dispensationalists, Bible-believing dispensationalists, like myself, are accused of teaching that only Romans through Philemon are for doctrine today, which I don't believe, even though I've been falsely accused of teaching that only Romans through Philemon are doctrine for today. But I do not believe that. It's the hyper-dispensationalists that do so. And just because you're against dispensationalism, it doesn't give you the right to say everybody is a hyper-dispensationalist. And it doesn't make sense to teach against dispensationalism by teaching against the primary doctrines of hyper-dispensationalists. That's like trying to teach against the Baptists by teaching against free will Baptists. That doesn't make sense. But there's all types of good Bible-believing dispensationalists who are slandered every day. If you listen to preaching, you're going to hear them slandered every day and said to teach things that the hyper-dispensationalists teach. But Bible-believing dispensationalists like Sam Gipp, William, Brake, William Grady, Robert Breaker, Peter Ruckman, Gene Kim, uh, James Modlish, David Walker, David Hoffman, all the very well-known men who are dispensationalists, they're constantly slandered. But those men aren't hyper-dispensationalists. And it isn't right to teach against dispensationalism as a whole by teaching against hyper-dispensationalism. Just like you don't uh, teach against Baptists by teaching against free will Baptists. I mean, there's different types of dispensationalists. I was listening to a sermon called The Devil's Doctrine of Dispensationalism by Roger Jimenez on YouTube. And he said... I'm, I'm going to teach against dispensationalism, and I don't have time to narrow down the different types of dispensationalism, but you just know it's all bad or whatever. But what he did was he taught against hyper-dispensationalism, and he used that to disprove dispensationalism entirely, which makes no sense. But real, real hyper-dispensationalists will only take Romans through Philemon as doctrine for us today, and even some even cut it down more than that to just the prison epistles. But this is also easily disproved with the Bible. 1 Corinthians 10, 9 through 10 says, Neither let us tempt Christ, as some of them also tempted, and were destroyed of serpents. Neither murmur ye, as some of them also murmured, and were destroyed of the destroyer. This is talking about things that happened in the Old Testament. And then the very next verse, verse 11, says, Not all these things happen unto them for in samples, and they are written for our admonition, upon whom the ends of the world are to come. So those things are said by Paul to be written for our admonition, and that means you should read them, and that they're important. And I know a lot of hyper-dispensationalists do believe that the other parts of the Bible for, are for our learning, but some of them don't. And then in Romans 15, 4, it says, For whatsoever things were written aforetime were written for our learning, that we through patience and comfort of the Scriptures might have hope. And you say, well, that's just practical application in all the other books of the Bible. And it is, but all Scripture is given by inspiration and profitable for doctrine. 2 Timothy 3.16 says, All Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. So the Old Testament isn't primarily doctrine for the church. It's to Israel. But there is still doctrine for us back there in the Old Testament. 
There's still some doctrine for us that you can find in the Gospels and the general epistles. And the Gospels aren't to the church, but you can still find doctrine for the church in the Gospels, as you can through all the books of the Bible. Uh, 1 Timothy 6 3 says, If any man teach otherwise and consent not to wholesome words, even the words of our Lord Jesus Christ, and to the doctrine which is according to godliness. So that is Paul telling Timothy, we should consent to the words of our Lord Jesus Christ. He said, even the words of our Lord Jesus Christ. And the words of the Lord Jesus Christ were in the Gospels. So there's there's doctrine for, for us in those. Now don't take it too far the other way now. As the non-dispensationalists. And don't just teach that everything in the Bible should be put on you today. As they say they believe when they actually don't believe. Or they'd be sacrificing animals in their backyard. Or in the back of their church. And don't take verses in the Gospels that apply to someone in the Old Testament or someone in the Tribulation and put those things on yourself today. That's how you get messed up. Don't go to the general epistles. Don't get a, go, don't go to Hebrews and James and 1st, 2nd Peter, 1st, 2nd, 3rd John, Jude, and Revelation and take things that are aimed doctrinally towards someone in the time of Jacob's trouble and apply those things to you doctrinally. You say, well, how do I know which ones to apply to me doctrinally? Get yourself acquainted with Paul's teachings to the church today. So we're not to one extreme where we say that Romans through Philemon are only doctrine today. And we're not to the other extreme where we say that all of the Bible is for us doctrinally. But figure out the doctrine that's directed to the church and view everything through the lens of what Paul taught about the church. And if it matches what Paul has for us, then you know it's doctrine for you and not someone else. And however you can get knowledge and understanding and instruction and righteousness out of every single verse in the entire Bible. Every single verse in the entire Bible is the Word of God. It's important. It's there for a reason. And Hebrews, James, 1st, 2nd Peter, 1st, 2nd, 3rd John, Jude, and Revelation are primarily directed to the church, but there is still doctrine for for them, for us in those books as well. For example, Re Revelation 1 5 says, And from Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness and the first begotten of the dead, and the prince of the kings of the earth, unto him that loved us and washed us from our sins. In his own blood. Now that is doctrine for us today. We are washed from our sins in the blood of Jesus. The hyper dispensationalist doesn't believe there is doctrine in Revelation for us or Revelation. And the way they can also this way they can also get rid of the confession of sins for today because they don't believe first John has any doctrine for us today. But 1 John 1, 9 says, If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And they say we don't have to confess our sins because our sins were forgiven when we believed the gospel. Well, of course they were. But this isn't about salvation. It's about fellowship. No one was ever saved and had their sins cleansed from confessing their sins. You don't confess your sins to be saved. This is about fellowship. So when you sin and you know that you do, does God not pop up in your head and say, you did that, it was wrong, and you need to talk, me, talk to me about it? How do you stay in fellowship with God if you can't even say you're sorry for your sins? But, and I know that's in First John, but the principle is there in the Pauline epistles. So view First John through the lens of the Pauline epistles. 1 Corinthians 11.31 For if we would judge ourselves, we should not be judged. So you can't judge yourself without even acknowledging to God that you messed up and confessing your sin and, talk, and talking to Him about it. But next, hyper-dispensationalists teach that there are no Christians in New Jerusalem. Even though New Jerusalem is for the bride. But they teach that the bride isn't the body of Christ. But the bride is the body of Christ. Revelation 21.2 2 
It says, And I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. Then verse 9 and 10, And there came unto me one of the seven angels, which had the seven vials full of the seven last plagues, and talked with me, saying, Come hither, and I will show thee the bride, the Lamb's wife. Who's the Lamb's wife? Us. And he carried me away in the spirit to a great and high mountain, and showed me that great city, the holy Jerusalem, descending out of heaven from God. So hypers many times believe the bride is Israel and not the church. And they would say Christians aren't going into New Jerusalem. Even though it said the bride, the lamb's wife. And even though Paul himself tells you who the lamb's wife is going to be. 2 Corinthians 11.2 For I am jealous over you with godly jealousy, for I have espoused you to one husband, that I may present you as a chaste virgin to Christ. So you see, we are the bride. And I've seen some teach the bride and the church aren't the same, but they are plainly the same. And the last thing I'm going to talk about about the hyper dispensationalists is that they also teach against the Lord's Supper for today, even though Paul plainly says in Corinthians to do it till he comes. Look at first Corinthians eleven twenty six. It says, For as often as ye eat this bread and drink this cup, ye do show the Lord's death till he come. So he ain't came yet, so we ought to still do it. And something funny is all the non dispens not all of them, but a popular group of non-dispensationalists who will slander all the dispensationalists and call us hyper-dispensationalists, they don't believe in taking the Lord's Supper for today, a doctrine of the hyper-dispensationalists, which is funny. And another crazy thing is they believe the church replaced Israel. That's pretty dispensational. That's more dispensational than I am because I don't believe the church replaced Israel. Um, they teach a lot of different, they teach there's a lot of differences in the Bible, but they just don't like that label of being a dispensationalist. They call it the devil's doctrine of dispensationalism. And they just slander people. They say, I've heard many of them say, Ruckman didn't believe there was grace in the Old Testament, even though he said in his commentaries and his book, How to Teach Dispensational Truth, that there's grace in every dispensation. And they'll slander us and say that we only take Romans through Philemon. They'll slander us and say that uh, we can, we believe we can do whatever we want since we're not under the law. Even though Paul plainly says in Romans chapter 6 that we, should we make void the law because of grace? He says, God forbid. Just because we're not under the law like we, they were in the Old Testament, doesn't believe we should continue in sin. But it's just a lot of slander that goes on. And it's people who are misinformed. They're misinformed on what Bible-believing dispensationalism is. So they teach against all dispensationalism by teaching against hyper-dispensationalism. And as I said for the third time, that's like teaching against every independent, fundamental, Bible-believing Baptist by teaching against the free will Baptist. It doesn't make any sense. You can't do that. If you're going to teach against Bible-believing dispensationalists, actually get their book and read what it says, and then take your Bible and teach against it. But I hope this has cleared up some things. I'm not a hyper-dispensationalist. I don't believe that Romans through Philemon are the only doctrine for us today. I believe there's doctrine. You can find doctrine throughout the entire Bible for the church. I believe there was grace in the Old Testament. I believe there was faith in the Old Testament. So a lot of these things that you hear about dispensationalists aren't true. And when you repeat these lies, you're just helping the devil keep a lie going and a rumor going. But you need to really find out what men believe instead of just assuming that you know what they believe. Don't just assume that you know 
what Sam Gitt believes because you heard a certain person say, don't just assume you know what William Grady believes because you saw a video, a clip from a video taken out of context. I mean, you can take a clip of a video of any preacher and make it seem like he's saying something crazy. You got to listen to the whole thing, get it in context what he's saying before you make a decision on whether or not he's teaching something that's against the Bible. But this has been an expose of hyper-dispensationalism.